my best to make sure we're actually recording tonight. And I'm gonna go share my screen again. We can get started. Um, welcome everybody. My name is Christy Morley and I am the Senior Naturalist here at Wissahickon Trails. Um, and just a quick round of instructions. Um, I think most of you are already muted, but just please make sure you stay muted. Uh, for the course of the presentation tonight, it gets a lot of feedback if, um, with all of us on the line, if people turn their, their um, microphones on. So please stay muted and use the chat box for questions. I will be stopping occasionally throughout the evening um, to look at the questions and uh, try to answer them. And um, the recording will be available online um, within a week um, after this. So hopefully there's, uh, if there's anything that you missed as we're doing this, um, you know, that will, should be available. And I will say as well, um, please feel free if you wanna email me afterwards, if there are specific questions that you have, um, I'm happy to answer those as well. So um, we're not really gonna be using cameras. So if you want a stronger internet connection, you can turn your own video off and um, that often strengthens the connection. Uh, Hide my thumbnail view so I have a full screen. So uh, away we go. So tonight we're going to talk about moths. Um, this is a trumpet vine sphinx moth on our uh, start page here. Uh, one that I actually took on the front of my house last summer. Uh, it showed up. Uh, a neighbor has trumpet vine in their yard so it was probably roosting on that uh, and laying the female was laying eggs there. There we go, okay, let's get that. So um, welcome again for anybody who's just joined us. So we are an environmental nonprofit based in Ambler, Pennsylvania. We were founded a little over 60 years ago to protect the land and water of the Wissahickon Creek, um, largely the Northern section in Montgomery County. And we work in partnership with the folks down in the Philadelphia County that uh, manage the Wissahickon as it enters the city of Philadelphia. We have saved nearly 1,300 acres of land from development, and on that land, we now have 12 nature preserves and 24 miles of trails that are open for you to enjoy. Um, I know that a number of you who registered for the program this evening are supporters of Wissahickon Trails, uh, but if you're not a supporter of us right now, um, please take a look at our website, uh, read a little bit more in detail a lot of the work that we have going on, um, and please consider becoming a supporter. Since we are a nonprofit organization, we do depend on our supporters to continue our mission. Um, and that financial piece is very important um, in making sure that we are able to continue our mission to protect uh, the land and the water. So thank you again to our supporters and um, I hope to encourage all of you to become supporters. So real quick tonight, what we're going to do is go through um, a little bit, a quick, overview uh, some slides about sort of setting the stage for this evening, um, then a little bit deeper dive into moth ecology, uh, some discussion of moth identification, threats and conservation, and then how to do moth watching at home and some citizen, citizen science projects that you can get involved in um, right from the comfort of your own backyard if you desire. So I will be stopping kind of in between each one of these sections for questions. So Again, as I said, please feel free to use the chat box and um, I will stop and answer those. So when I say moths, this is what a lot of people think of. Uh, they think they're dull, they think they're boring, they think they're pests. And okay, there are moths that are kind of dull and kind of boring looking, and there are moths that we have that are pests, this is true. But in fact, the vast majority of moths that we have um, aren't pests at all. Uh, they're actually really diverse group of insects. Um, a lot of them are very attractive and, and really kind of cool looking. And as I said, they're really not pests at all, um, but they are actually a very vital part of an ecosystem. And they are important for a couple of reasons. The first being, um, they are actually pollinators. Given their hairy structure, which we're gonna talk a little bit more in detail about, um, they have the ability to capture pollen 
um, anytime they land on a plant or where there's pollen around and scatter that pollen far and wide uh, because they fly. And so they are, they're not the most efficient pollinators that we have, but they can be an important um, pollinator in a lot of areas. A lot of the moths that we have here aren't predominantly the important pollinators that we have, but in other, other areas of the world, um, some of the moths are very important pollinators. So overall, they're an important component of the ecosystem. And the second reason is, is that they are a food source. So this is a Carolina chickadee, uh, for those who are not familiar. It's a fairly common bird in our area. If you have a backyard bird feeder, you probably have this bird showing up in the wintertime. Um, and it raises one nest full of babies every summer. It can lay anywhere from three to 10 eggs. On average, it lays about five or six eggs in each nest. And it, it raises one nest each summer. And what do those adult parents feed those babies in that nest? Caterpillars. Lots and lots of caterpillars. Caterpillars are a really high protein, easily digestible food for baby birds. And one chickadee nest needs between roughly 400 to 600 caterpillars a day to feed all their babies. So over the two and a half weeks that those babies are in the nest and being fed, they need between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars. That's a lot of caterpillars and that's only one nest. And there's the vast majority of birds in our area use caterpillars as a predominantly um, major food source for their babies because it is such a high protein, easily digestible um, kind of meal for them. So consider all the other birds in the area that are raising babies and you can imagine how many caterpillars we actually need to feed those birds. And if the caterpillars decline, the birds decline because that is a major food source for babies. Um, and the parents would have to work so much harder to find food if those caterpillars weren't around. In addition, adult moths are um, a, an important food source for a number of groups of, of organisms. So the, the adult moths, because they fly at night, get eaten by bats. Um, they do also get eaten by birds and spiders uh, because they fly into spider webs and get caught. Um, but really by and far large, the, the main um, role that moths play is um, all those caterpillars that they have uh, feeding birds. And so with, with that, I'm gonna jump into the moth, eco moth ecology really quick. And we're gonna talk about their life cycle and a little bit more about them. So I'm gonna start out sort of with the idea of what is a moth? Um, and to do that, I wanna start a little bit at a higher level and sort of see where moths fit in uh, the overall categories of insects. So I've got this chart here and down the side are the, the column, uh, on the right hand side are the names of a number of insect orders. And these are the most common ones. Um, the scientific names, this big giant orange slice here with 350,000 species is beetles. Uh, this one here with 154,000, this gray one here is, um, get it right, this is flies. So um, all the flies fit into this category. And next, this 150,000 blue wedge up here that's popped out, this is the Lepidopetra, and this is where moths live. And they are grouped together with butterflies as an order. So this 150,000 species is a total um, world globally of moths and butterflies. Of that, only about 10% are butterflies. So about 15,000 species. The rest, 90% of that number, or 135,000 species are all moths. So moths outnumber butterflies by orders of magnitude. There are so many more moths than there are butterflies. And we're never really aware of that because most of the time they're flying when we're asleep. And so there's this whole other world that's going on out there um, while we're snug in our bed. And so you can see, I mean, there are a lot of them worldwide. And when we talk about moths and butterflies, um, the first question that a lot of times comes up is how do you tell them apart? How do you know if it's a moth or a butterfly? And there's a number of ways. Um, in general, 
we tend to think the smaller, more drab things are moth and the butterflies are larger and more colorful, but that's not always the case. Um, in fact, you saw from the earlier slide, a lot of moths are actually fairly colorful and some of them are actually quite large. Moths do fly at night um, much more than butterflies do. Butterflies really only fly during the day. They need to get warm enough to fly. Moths fly at night, but there are some day active moths as well. Um, one of the big differences is in how they pupate, and we'll talk about their life cycle in a minute, but uh, moths make this silky cocoon and butterflies make a shiny chrysalis, and that is a key difference between them. Another difference that people refer to is um, moths tend to rest with their wings open and butterflies rest with their wings closed. So this example, the left-hand picture is a moth, and this, you can see its wings are kind of stretched out and flat. And the butterfly here, its wings are closed together as it's on the flower. Now, this is true for a lot of moths and a lot of butterflies, but it's not true for all of them. So it's not always the best clue. For example, this picture that I just put up, this is a moth, this is a ghost moth. And you can see its wings are together and closed. Um, as it's resting. And this is a butterfly. This is actually a uh, cross line skipper. And a lot of the skipper butterflies tend to rest with their wings open like this one does. And so part of this is, you know, there is some general characteristics of them that is true. Um, but it also shows you how closely they're related because there is that crossover between them. They're not exactly um, two very different categories of insects. Uh, the reason that they are as closely related as they are, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, is because they all have scales on their wings. And that's really what sets them apart from a lot of the other flying insects, is that scale. And Lepidopedra actually means scaled wing. So that's why they're grouped together. Um, another key difference, and we'll look at this in detail in a couple slides, is the shape of their antenna. Uh, moths have very feathery antennas and butterflies have antennas with clubs at the end. And that is one of the key ways um, that you can usually tell them apart fairly easily uh, when you see them in the field. And again, just to come back to the numbers, so for moths, we have about 12,000 species in North America. And for butterflies, there's about 825. So again, orders of magnitude, more moths um, that we never see because they come out at night. Um, from an anatomical perspective, butterflies and moths are pretty much the same. Um, they are all, you know, they're insects with three segments, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Um, the thorax has two pairs of wings attached, the forewing and the hindwing, as you see here, they both have that. Um, three pairs of legs attached at the thorax, and then um, the abdomen region. Um, they both have antenna, they both have compound eyes, which we'll talk about a little bit more detail in a second. Butterflies all have this proboscis, this curled up uh, straw, if you will, um, which is how they get nectar out of flowers. Not all moths have that because not all moths eat. Some do, but a number of them actually do not. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So. Um, again, from an overall perspective of just a quick glance, butterflies and moths actually look fairly similar. Um, the antenna are where you're going to find um, the key differences. And then, generally speaking, time of day in which they're active. So if we talk about their life cycle, um, like butterflies and a lot of other insects, they go through complete metamorphosis on their journey to adulthood. So for most of their life, they look nothing like the adult version of themselves that we think of as a moth. But they go through the three stages of eggs, caterpillar, and a cocoon to get to that adult version. So tonight, we're going to use the Cecropia moth as our example. This is an absolutely gorgeous moth as an adult. I've actually never seen one in person. It is one I really want to see. Um, these are ones that a lot of people um, the eggs can be fairly easy to find because they're relatively large, as you see here with the uh, penny um, for scale, compared to some eggs of 
butterflies and other moths. Um, the eggs are really big. Uh, the caterpillar, as you see here, is fairly large. And the cocoon, which we're gonna talk about more, is also fairly obvious. So a lot of people actually raise these, um, like people raise monarchs, as what to see, you know, enjoy the life cycle, um, the whole life cycle themselves, um, something that I would really like to do. Um, and I encourage you to consider that um, for butterflies or moths. It's kind of fun to be able to participate in that, and it's really not that hard. Um, these are large moths. So the adults can be four and a half to like six inches across from uh, the tip of their wings. Um, they're fairly common actually, but they're very nocturnal. So you're very unlikely to see them, the adult moths in the daytime, they're generally gonna be hiding somewhere. And um, they tend to come out after, much after it gets dark. So we're talking like, you know, midnight-ish time frame in the summer when it doesn't really get dark until 9 or 9.30 sometimes. So uh, they come out very late. Moths, like butterflies, have host plants that they lay their eggs on. So, and that's the only thing that the caterpillars can eat. Um, the example that most of us are fairly familiar with is the monarch butterfly and the fact that it needs milkweed to feed its caterpillars. The Cecropia moths are actually what we call generalists. Uh, they have a number of tree species that they can use. Uh, they can use apple, they can use ash trees, beech trees, birch trees, elm, maple, oak, and willow. And they'll lay their eggs on any of those and the caterpillars will survive. Um, not all moths are this varied. Some moths are more like the monarch where they only have one plant that they can use. And some have two or three options. A lot more moths actually use trees and shrubs than butterflies. Butterflies have a tendency to use more flowering kinds of plants, um, but moths tend to use a lot of trees as well. So another difference between the species. And the eggs can be laid singly or in groups, depending on the moth species. An adult moth can make anywhere from 100 to 400 eggs, depending on the species. Um, she doesn't usually lay all those eggs in one place. She might lay 10 eggs on one leaf and then find another leaf and lay another 10 eggs and then um, lay those eggs over the course of her life. Um, caterpillars are generally the only feeding stage of moths. So this is where they get all the most, for most of them, all the energy that they need to power them through their cocoon phase and their adult life all comes from the energy they store when they eat as a caterpillar. Uh, and they eat voraciously. And this is why some people don't like them because they eat the leaves of their host plants. Um, but there are some things that you can do to combat that in your garden, especially, and we'll talk about that in the conservation section, but especially when we're talking about native um, moths. Now, there are a few things that we have that are not native in this area, like um, Japanese beetles that will eat your leaves as well and can truly be a garden pest. Um, spotted lanternflies as well. So, uh, you know, I understand there are pests that we need to deal with, but generally speaking, when we're talking about these caterpillars, they don't usually rise to the level of a pest. And again, think about if you have a large oak tree in your yard, and especially if that oak tree is old, chances are you're never going to see these caterpillars up in those leaves because relatively speaking the caterpillars are small compared to the size of the tree and the tree has so many leaves that you might see some damage from caterpillars eating it but you're not likely to see all the leaves gone off of a full-size tree from the caterpillars eating. Caterpillars go through several stages. Um, they're known as instars. So they grow larger and they shed their skin at each stage. Often the very young caterpillars or what we call first instars look very much different from the last stage or the fifth instars. Oftentimes the first instars look, um, a lot of them are black. A lot of them don't look anything like they will look as they get a little bit older. Um, and the caterpillars have a variety of defense mechanisms to prevent being eaten. Uh, they don't want to be eaten by birds, um, even though they, a lot of them do get eaten. So a lot, they include camouflage, really trying to blend in with the leaves of the plants that they're on. 
Um, the warning colors, so on this caterpillar, the red and the yellow, those are generally in nature warning colors that say, I don't taste good. Um, the hairs or spines that are on there um, are also a mechanism to uh, prevent um, birds or other things eating them. Those spines, I will say, some of those can be irritating to us as humans. Um, they can puncture our skin. They're not usually venomous or poisonous to us, although there are a few caterpillars like that. More often than not, they cause like a contact dermatitis. They can feel like a bee sting. Um, and some people can be really sensitive to that. So um, if you're going caterpillar hunting, use extreme caution uh, in, and I would recommend that you don't actually touch them with your hands. Um, first of all, they're relatively fragile, so they are easy to kind of squish um, without meaning to, uh, but those spines can be um, quite um, harmful to our skin and, and make them and very irritating. So um, heavy gloves or just move them on a leaf and don't actually try to touch them. Um, once the caterpillar has reached its final instar stage, and the number of stages depends on the species, a lot of them are somewhere around five or six. Um, the, the caterpillar will molt about five or six times uh, before it gets ready to um, put itself into its cocoon and become what we call a pupa. And this is the period where it is basically taking all of its caterpillar parts and making them all moth parts. And a lot of these parts were already growing inside the caterpillar. And this is a time when um, they're sort of rearranging a lot of their systems internally, their digestive system, their respiratory system, and growing their wings out completely and getting ready to become an adult. The length, we're gonna look in detail at the cocoons in a, in a second because those are a really um, key separation point between moths and butterflies excuse me, but the length of time that they spend in the cocoon can be um, very different. Some only spend a couple of weeks, some spend a couple of months, some moths, like the Cecropia moth, actually um, overwinter in their cocoon. And so they form um, their cocoons late in the summer, in the early, very early fall, and they stay there in their cocoon until, uh, spring and then they come out as adults. Some um, you can see here for the Cecropia moth, it's like anchored in a shrub or the small branches of a tree. It's hard to tell. Um, and a lot of moths do that. They kind of hang their cocoons up in a tree or a, a shrub, but a lot of them actually um, pupate in leaf litter. Some dig holes and pupate underground and it can all, you know, it varies by species. Um, and once they're done in their cocoon, they get out of their cocoon. Uh, in some cases, the Cecropia moths, and it's hard to see from this picture, I couldn't find a good picture online. They actually build an escape hatch at one end so that the adult moth can push its way out of the cocoon uh, when it's time to come out. And the adults come out and the length of time that an adult moth lives is very short, like one to two weeks. So you can see in the grand scheme of things, if it takes a roughly, I'm gonna say roughly a week to go from egg, well, in most cases, an, a, a week to a month and a half to go from egg to caterpillar, and then the cocoon can be anywhere from a couple of weeks to four or five months. Um, you can see that they spend the vast majority of their time not as an adult moth. Uh, that is a very short portion of their life cycle. And a lot of those adult moths, as I said, do not eat, including the Cecropia moth. It has no mouthpieces. So all the energy that it needs to survive in its cocoon and live its a couple weeks as an adult comes from all those leaves that the caterpillar eats um, in those stages. There are some moths that do eat. There's some that um, drink nectar from, from plants just like butterflies do. Um, there's some that actually eat pollen, collect pollen and eat it more like we think of bees doing, for example. Um, worldwide, there are some very unique moths 
and what they eat. So there are actually some that can drink tears from sleeping mammals and birds. Uh, we don't have any of those here in the United States. Some eat fruit. Uh, I think there are actually a couple in the United States, more in uh, the south of the country that will eat fruit, uh, especially um, like rotting fermenting fruit uh, from fruit trees or orchards. And there are a couple of moths actually that can pierce the skin of mammals, in, in, including humans, um, and feed on blood. Now, there aren't any that do that in the United States, so you don't have to worry. There's a couple in India and I think one in China that do that, um, but there's none of those in the United States. But you can see they're quite uh, varied in the way that they live their lives uh, around the world. Um, so real quick, I wanna go into uh, talking about their cocoons. Um, this is, you saw from the other uh, slide as well, kind of what a cocoon, the outside looks like. Um, Moths spin silk around themselves and they may add leaves or other items from the environment to um, molt inside and then they molt inside their casing. And so the, here's the difference between the um, uh, moth cocoon on the left and the butterfly chrysalis on the right. This is a monarch chrysalis. And so inside of that cocoon is where the moth does its final uh, molting stage and becomes a pupa. For the butterflies, they don't have that extra protective case. A caterpillar, a monarch caterpillar, hung itself upside down on this leaf, um, formed this little tiny white silk pad here to anchor itself, and then molted its last layer of skin, and this is what was underneath, and that's it. So this is becomes kind of its hardened exoskeleton for the time that it's in a, a cocoon. Now, it's misleading to say that the, in some respects, that the moth doesn't do this. They do, it's just inside the cocoon. So inside a Cecropia cocoon actually is a pupa that looks like this. So this looks much more like a butterfly, butterfly chrysalis. Um, you can actually start to see these big swoopy things here are actually the antenna of the moth. These here are its wings um, already being formed in the pupal state. And then it's, this is, is, will become its abdominal section once it comes out and its wings expand. And you can see that this looks much more like a chrysalis. The main difference is this happens inside that cocoon where the butterflies just are open um, without that extra protective layer. This is what a Cecropia moth caterpillar looks like as it's creating its cocoon. So you can see it's wrapped a leaf or a couple of leaves around itself. It started spinning silk to anchor those leaves to it and then it'll fill in so it makes um, the very dense um, full cocoon to protect itself. This is a photograph of a Cecropia moth that was actually predated. So a, a parasite actually ate the pupa out of here. You can actually see the hole here. But this gives you the idea of what, what inside that cocoon looks like. So it's made this pocket here where it's molted from its last stage of a caterpillar into this pupal state. And then it's all protected by this dense mat of leaves and silk webbing um, that make the, the cocoon. So the main difference is that the moths make this extra protective layer that helps them survive, um, that the butterflies do not. Interestingly enough, this is true, you know, so a lot of the big moths that make cocoons that look like this specifically, um, they do overwinter in their cocoon. So this dense mat of, of um, silk and leaves helps them control moisture levels inside there and keep from getting dried out in cold, dry winter air and really helps them survive over the winter since they're often just hanging on a tree, like looking like a dead leaf, essentially. Um, but interestingly enough, there are some butterflies that have 
um, overwinter as chrysalises in our area with just this single layer of protective skin, if you will, um, on them, and they survive just fine. So it's an interesting ecological adaptation um, that they have done to, um, you know, allow them to survive over the winter um, in both cases, um, so that they're ready to go in the spring um, to start creating the next generation. So I said that moth antenna and butterfly antenna are different. And here is a good example. So the big picture with the yellow fuzzy face, this is a moth. And I forget what moth this is, sorry, as an example of. But they often have these very broad, very feathery looking antenna. Butterflies on the other hand have these very narrow antennas with these club ends. Um, and you can very much see this in the field. If you're looking at a butterfly or moth up close, even naked eye, but certainly with binoculars, um, you can very often see the moths' really big antennas. And so adult moths have, since a lot of them don't eat, um, they have one biological imperative, and that is to find a mate, reproduce, and pass on their genetic legacy. And in that one to two weeks that they're alive, that's really what they're focusing on. Even the ones that eat, that's really what they're focusing on, is finding a mate and reproducing. And since they operate largely in the dark, they need to find another mechanism besides their vision to find each other. Um, we're going to talk about their eyes in a minute, and they do see, but you can imagine that being able to see in the dark is rather difficult, and so they need to make sure that they can find a moth of the right species to mate with and pass on their genetic legacy. And so the way they do that for moths is the majority of the females actually excrete pheromone, chemical hormones that they waft out in the air and the males actually use these big antenna as noses. And they use them to sense out the pheromones that the females of their species are producing and find them and mate. Now, most moth females also have these antenna, and they probably use them um, in a similar way in terms of sensing uh, and smelling, if you will, um, that they're on the right tree or right host plant um, to lay their caterpillars on. And the ones that eat may use those antenna to also sort of as, act as a nose to help find the food um, that they need to find. Um, during their lifetime. So they serve a multitude of pur purposes, um, but they are definitely almost always sort of big and broad and almost look like feathers on the top of their heads. Um, a note about their eyes. So they do have compound eyes, basically like what we see in flies or bees. It's essentially thousands of tiny little independent photoreception units that are all wired to their their brain and their neural system. Um, they don't see, because they have compound eyes, they don't see the same way that we do. And because these guys are really adapted to, to night vision, um, their eyes are much more sensitive to small changes in light um, than our eyes are. And they're very well adapted to sensing motion. Um, so that's why if you get, and butterflies are the same way, if you get too close to them, even if you don't think you're close enough to startle them, um, you will startle them because they can sense that motion very well. And also if your shadow falls across them, that slight change in light from the shadow, your shadow falling across them if they're sitting on a plant um, will ca often cause them to startle again because their eyes are so sensitive to those um, potentially minute changes in light. Some moths are actually sensitive to UV light and um, blue and green wavelengths as well, um, which again just helps them perceive the world in a way that we can't really even begin to understand because we don't see in ultraviolet. And, but there's lots of other wavelengths of light out there that they could be using to communicate that we just don't really um, know how to explain. Uh, and we don't really understand what that looks like to them because we don't see that way. Um, moths can hear. 
very well in some cases. Um, they don't have ears the same way that we do, but they have a membrane system that vibrates basically just like our eardrum does. And so they, a lot of them are actually tuned to the frequencies that bats use because bats are out at night when it's dark. Moths are out at night when it's dark. Um, moths do not want to be the bat's dinner. And so if they can hear the bats coming, they have a chance of escaping. So they may be able to um, hear the bat's ultrasonic uh, frequencies that they're putting out and be able to use that to escape and move out of the way. One of the ways they do that, and if you've watched butterflies fly, because most of us have probably seen more butterflies flying than moths, butterflies often fly in a sort of erratic flight pattern when they're moving, so they kind of zigzag. Moths do the same thing. And that is really another way of avoiding predation. Um, that zigging and zagging is kind of a way to try to stay away from whatever is chasing them. So I said we're, scales are uh, an important distinction. Um, and what makes moths and butterflies separate from the rest of the insects is these scales. And these scales are actually modified hairs. Um, that are laid down in a shingle-like fashion, just kind of like the side of your house or, or your roof, um, laid down on top of each other. And this is where the color on moths and butterflies come from. Uh, the wings themselves are actually sandwiched between these layers of scales, and they're actually transparent. So it's the scales that give moths and butterflies their fantastic colors and all the manner of diversity around that. And this magnified picture on the right here is this top portion of this Luna moth's eye spot. So there's the black and white, uh, and then it fades into yellow and a little bit of red, and then it, you can't see it in this ex blown up shot because it's uh, too focused, but there's then would go out into this big white um, rest of the eye spot. And these eye spots are another way of protecting themselves um, and trying to lure predators to think that this is where the head of the moth is. And so these tails look like modified antenna. And again, it's a way of trying to fool a predator to say, oh, if you're going to grab me, grab me here, because this is where my head is. And so that's what, you know, you want to try to incapacitate me when in fact the head is up here. And if even if a moth gets part of its wing taken off by a predator, it can often still fly and escape um, and live the rest of its life, short that it may be, um, just fine. Moths and butterflies as well um, lose, shing, uh, lose scales over time. Um, they get worn off when they land on things, when they bump into each other, uh, you know, all of that kind of stuff that if they're handled by humans, um, the, the scales can come off on our fingers. Um, but again, it's not something that that loss of scales generally doesn't impede their ability to fly um, unless they lose all of them for some reason. Scales um, for moths, particularly because they tend to have uh, so many layers of them. And we saw from some of the earlier pictures, a lot of them have these really furry looks to them that butterflies don't have. They, um, they use those scales as part of their thermal regulation. So they have so many layers of them that it can actually help them stay warm. Again, because they're flying at night and even in the summer, night is cooler generally speaking, than it is during the daytime and when the sun's out. And so they don't have the advantage that butterflies do. Butterflies in the morning, they can go find a spot in the sun and just sit there until they're warm enough to fly. Moths have to use other um, techniques to make sure that their bodies stay warm enough to fly. And part of that is um, through their scales. They can puff them up like birds puff up feathers, particularly the ones on their thorax and abdomen and help keep them warm. Um, they, uh, um, and then they can also, um, the scales, because there's so many of them, they can use them to um, absorb sound, which also helps jam bat sonar for some species. Um, the bats send out sonar and they are waiting for that signal to come back to them. 
to know, okay, my prey is over here. That's where my signal came back from. And if they send out that signal to a moth that is able to sort of absorb that sound, um, the signal will never come back. So a uh, bat would think that it just, you know, it sends its signal out into the world and there's nothing there that it needs to worry about. So it's gonna go hunt for prey someplace else. So it's a pretty cool mechanism that they have um, to be able to do that, to avoid predation, uh, particularly by bats, which are the biggest predators of adult moths. Um, last section before questions. So um, why are moths att attracted to light? <laughs> Nobody really knows, I'm gonna say that right up front. First of all, not all moths are actually attracted to light. Uh, scientists have done studies where they have found um, a variety of species of moths feeding right next to where they have a light trap set up and those moths could not be bothered by the light at all. Um, one of the things that a lot of researchers believe now is that it's not as much of an attraction as it is um, a trap for them. And the theories around that, there's a couple of them. And again, this is where nobody's entirely positive why they're doing this. Um, one is um, what they call, is related to sort of the moon orientation that moths use. So on a normal moonlit night, um, moths will use the moon to orient. That helps them orient up from down in a dark environment. So for pretty much all of us, whether it's light or dark, the lightest part of the sky is always up because either the sun's up there, and even when the sun's not out, the, the clouds reflecting the light, it's light up there. Um, versus on, down on the ground, it tends to be darker. And then same at night, if the moon and the stars are out, there's more light up. And so moths, butterflies, birds as well, don't fly upside down. So they they fly with the light part of them on the top of them. And so they use the moon to help them orient in, in normal situations. When you have a light that's like a light trap like this, where this light is sitting here, it's not just sending light waves in one direction, like the moon would essentially be doing because moths don't fly all the way to the moon. They always stay underneath of it. But a light bulb is gonna be putting out those light waves in all directions. And so the thought is that moths are not able to properly orient like they normally would. And so then they kind of get stuck in the light. Um, the other part of that has to do with the lightest part of the sky being one of the ways that they try to avoid predators. Um, it's generally better to fly up because there's usually more room to maneuver than flying down. And so oftentimes moths will fly up to get away from things. And again, this, a light source is going to act like the moon or stars and attract a moth to fly up towards it. Why they stay there is a whole other issue, but the leading theory right now is that the light actually traps them. So just like us, their eyes have to adapt to the dark and they're much more able to be in the dark than we are and sort of see better than we do in the dark. But if we stay out long enough, and especially if we stay out from sunset to full dark, our eyes actually adapt. If there's no lights to mess up our night vision, our eyes actually adapt relatively well and can see much more than we think we can normally see in the dark because we're used to having all those lights around. Moths are the same way. They have this dark adaptation that works really well and better than ours does because they're used to living in the dark that they, um, when they're introduced to this really bright light source, they can't overcompensate for that. And their, their dark adaptation and their night their night vision, if you will, um, basically gets blinded and they can't function. And so because it's so bright, the theory, one of the theories is anyway, that they sort of settle down on the sheet and just stay there because they think it's daytime. And so, okay, I'm done. I'm not gonna fly anymore. I need to find a place to rest. And this is as good as any because I can't see to leave this area. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of, why they end up on sheets like this when researchers set up 
uh, light traps to try to survey what moths are in an area. Another interesting thing that um, researchers have found is that younger moths tend to be more attracted. And one of the ways that you can tell the age of a moth and a butterfly for that matter is sort of the freshness of the scales, the intensity of their colors. Um, older moths tend to look faded and worn. They might have pieces of their wings missing um, where they've uh, gotten nipped by a predator or you know, had run into a branch or something like that along the way and scraped off a few more of their scales. And so you can actually tell sort of a fresh moth versus an old moth relatively easily. And a lot of studies have shown that it seems like it's the younger moths that are more attracted to the light. And it may be a byproduct of them trying to understand and sort of map their home range. And they see this unusual light source and all of these other things them trying to orient and then they're flying blind and so they get stuck in the light. Um, older moths, since they have sort of mapped their home range already, if that light hasn't been around, they're less bothered by it. They sort of know it doesn't belong there, so they're going to ignore it um, and maneuver around it and stay away from um, coming into where it's able to sort of trap them um, to the point that they can't leave because they couldn't see. And also moths are more attracted to light traps like this when there are no other competing lights in the area, including the moon. So um, one of the ways to try to study moths is to do these light traps, but you do need to do it in areas where it's relatively dark um, to try to maximize the numbers of moths that will come in. So I'm gonna stop here and uh, take a look at our chat and see what questions we've got. Oh, so, okay, I'm going to start with the second question first. Where do they go during the day? Um, they hide under leaves, on tree branches, on tree trunks, on bricks on the side of your house. Um, anything that, that looks like they feel like they can camouflage themselves um, for. Which came first, the moth or the butterfly? Did butterflies evolve from moths or vice versa? I think butterflies evolved from moths, if I remember correctly. Um, but there is actually some debate about that. And, but I think given the sheer number of species, it's generally believed that um, moths have been around longer than butterflies. And the light abil the ability to fly during the day um, came later. How many broods do most moths in our region have? Um, most moths, well, I shouldn't say that, one to two, roughly. Um, there may be a couple moths that have three, um, but largely one to two. Oh, somebody asked, where can you find the Cecropia moths and caterpillars? If I knew, I would love to share it with you. Most people find them on their host trees. So things like oaks or willows, um, that branches are low to the ground. A lot of people tend to find them in the fall after the leaves have fallen off the trees. The vast majority of leaves are off the trees and then they look at the leaves that are not left and see if there's any cocoons in there. And then they'll bring those cocoons home and usually um, keep them in like an aquarium type setting in their garage and see what comes out in the spring. Sometimes it's not Cecropia moths. Sometimes it might be some of the other big silk moths that we have. There's a couple of other species um, of those but they're similar to the Cecropia moth. That's the way I know most people find them. Some people find the caterpillars um, and, and collect the caterpillars, same thing. With the caterpillars, it's just like raising butterflies. You have to uh, provide them that food. So if you found them on a plant, bring some leaves of that plant home with you um, to, for them to eat until they get ready to become a caterpillar. I mean, to become a pupa. What is the most common moth in our area? I honestly don't know. Um, that is a really good question and I have no idea. I'm going to make note of that because I'm going to try to find the answer. I have to do a video on the wildlife of the Wissahickon um, in the next week or so and I'm answering people's questions and I'm going to put that question in because I don't know the answer to it. Um, host plant for woolly bears. Oh, we're going to talk about woolly bears at the end. So I'm going to hold that question for a second. 
Um, is the Luna moth the only moth in our area without a mouth? No, there's a lot of moths in our area that do not eat. Um, I don't know like percentage wise right off the numbers um, in our immediate area. Um, it's actually kind of hard to find numbers of moths and species and we're going to talk about this a little bit in the identification section because we probably don't actually have all of the moths identified yet and so um, there's not always really good numbers of, of what's out there um, for regions but um, the luna moth is certainly not the only one um, that doesn't eat there's a number of them that do okay um, that's all the questions I see for now. So I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna jump into moth identification as soon as my slides catch up with me here. There we go, okay. So moth identification, I'm gonna tell you right now, I only have two slides on this because it is difficult and it is frustrating. Um, Despite the different the occurrence of some really flashy, easily identified moths like the Luna moth or the Cecropia moth, um, there are still a lot of really similar brown and gray moths out there that are really hard to tell apart. Um, I'm going to talk in the last section about some resources around that that can help you with moth identification. But what I want to focus on this section right now is um, one of the things that can kind of help you is this idea of, and if you search online for National Moth Week 2015, you can, and common moth families, um, this is a PDF printout that you can get that shows you kind of the shape, excuse me, of some of the more common moth families. And sometimes, um, and people who were with me on the um, Firefly, presentation, this is kind of the same as fireflies. Sometimes it's really difficult to get down to the species level of identification, um, particularly for families that a lot of them look very, very similar and shades of browns and grays. So sometimes settling for a family level is what we have to do. And there are some key differences in shapes, uh, postures in how they're at rest, and you can use that as a clue. There are a lot of moths in our area that fall in this top category up here in the left. Um, these are what we call micro moths. They're really tiny, like your pinky fingernail small um, and very tiny and hard to see. So it can be really difficult to identify any of those to the species level without, oops, sorry, putting them under a microscope, which most of us aren't going to take the time to do. Um, a couple of things that I do want to mention, like butterflies, um, moths have seasons. So there are some moths that tend to be out and about earlier in the year, and some moths that tend to be out and about later in the year. And so um, luna moths are actually one that tend to be early, and they tend to be gone by this late in the summer. They're much, much harder to find. They're in their pupil state and they're looking for a place to spend the winter and then they'll come out next spring. Other moths, the moths that have two broods, maybe you were going to see them all the way from April until September because the first generation comes out, they mate, they lay eggs, those eggs hatch, the caterpillars turn into um, moths, adult moths, what, halfway through the summer ish. And then those adult moths spend the rest of their life looking for mates and producing the next generation that's going to overwinter as um, either a caterpillar or a cocoon. Most of them overwinter as cocoons. So those are the kinds of things that are happening. And so those species of moths that have more than one brood in our area are going to be um, spread over a longer period of time and easier to find. In addition, like I said in the beginning, we do have a couple of day active moths. So this one right here on the purple flowers, this is a snowberry clear wing moth. This is actually a moth. Uh, it, it looks like a hummingbird for all intents and purposes, but it really isn't. It's a moth. And there's another um, clear wing moth that also visits um, flowers to eat. Uh, and they're very day active. Um, 
you know, out uh, foraging nectar from flowers. Likewise, this um, on the yellow flower here is a golden collared uh, scape moth and they're day active as well. Um, and on this one, you can actually start to see the uh, antenna and looking sort of wide and feathery uh, as well. These guys are out looking for nectar, they eat. So, and you can see in both cases, uh, the snow, the clear wing moth, uh, this loopy line right here that I'm following with my cursor, this is their proboscis stuck into the nectar uh, the flower of the plant gathering nectar. And likewise, um, underneath its antenna, the skate moth has this tiny little brown um, L-shaped proboscis doing the same thing, gathering nectar from this flower. So a lot of the day flying ones are nectar eaters, um, and that's where you, where you will find them is on flowers um, collecting nectar. Um, a really cool family of moths and these guys are kind of fun to see if you can see them in person because one of the things that they tend to do when they're on a um, like a light trap is they flutter their wings and so when they're at rest they're very plain very nondescript they blend in with tree trunks and that kind of thing um, very easily this moth is called a betrothed underwing and their underwing is very vibrantly colored and this varies from shades of red to orange to pink, depending, and the patterns are slightly different depending on the um, species, but you won't see it unless they move their top wings out of the way. Um, but when they're on a light trap, they often um, flutter their top wings and so you can see it coming through. So they're represented here by these white lines on this silhouette because this is kind of the shape that they take typically when they're at rest and, and you can see them, um, see that underwing portion there. Um, the other thing, oh, so I was talking about caterpillars earlier for uh, birds and what, and the importance of caterpillars for birds. So most of us would tend to call this an inchworm because that's, they move like, that's the inchy along, you know, they pick their front feet up, they move the back feet and then they set the front feet down and it's that inching, hitching along the tree branch like that. Um, all of these caterpillars, these inchworms, they come from this uh, geometer moth family. And those are the ones that are the predominant food for birds. There's a lot of members of moths, different species of moths in this family, um, but they all make inchworm caterpillars, uh, varying shades of brown and green, some with stripes, some with not stripes, some have pairs, some don't, but most of them um, look like very similar to this representation here and those are the ones that are predominantly um, what we're talking about when we're talking about the caterpillars that birds eat. Now there are other moth caterpillars, there's other butterfly caterpillars, there's other insect uh, pupa and larva that birds eat as well, but these inchworm caterpillars are what make up uh, a lot of birds diet for feeding their baby birds uh, in the nest. And as I said, we're going to talk about um, some ID helpers uh, in the last section. So one of the tips that I want to give you, and we're going to talk about moth watching at home, but one of the tips I do want to give you is, in general, when you're out in nature and taking a walk, um, particularly on some of our trails where things tend to be a little bit more natural and there's grasses and flowers growing up pretty close to the edges of the paths, slow down and keep your eyes peeled because you may find things. Um, these are pictures, so this is a, an old cocoon that I found in a tree on our Crossways Preserve. It was empty. Whatever was in there had already come out, but it probably was a silk moth, a cecropia moth kind of thing um, in there at one point. But all of the, these things are, with the exception of one, are moths and moth caterpillars that I found not bringing them to a light trap. Um, these were just things I found either on a screen window, on a brick wall, um, on a fence post, and caterpillars that I found out walking. So it is possible to see these things um, if you're slowing down and paying attention and being aware that you should look for them. They show up in odd places. Like I said, the one at the beginning of the presentation was on the brick of my house one day last summer. Um, this guy, this yellow guy here, which is uh, called a yellow slant line, this was on the hood of my car um, one morning. So, and this 
white caterpillar down here is a banded sphinx moth caterpillar. And this black one is a giant leopard moth caterpillar. And I found both of these in my yard on my driveway. One was walking my driveway, one was near um, a stump that's in my backyard. So again, they're out there, they're around, um, pay attention. And you might be surprised what you can find. This really weird looking one down here, this green and burgundy black striped thing. Um, this is, a, oh, this, sorry, this is the banded sphinx caterpillar. The one on the end is the American dagger, the white one, got my list wrong. This is a banded sphinx caterpillar. Um, I was bird watching down in Cape May and it was walking in the grass at the side of the path. There it was. Um, I so wanted to bring it home with me. <laughs> I didn't because I was in a state park and you're not supposed to collect things from state parks. What, number one. Number two, at the time, I didn't know what its host plant was. So I didn't know if it was still in a stage where I needed to feed it and I didn't know what to feed it. So I didn't want to bring it home. Um, but I really wanted to I'll tell you that right now. The only one that I, that I got a picture of because it came to a light trap that I had in my backyard is this one up here that really does not look like a moth probably to most of us. Um, this is a rhododendron boar moth uh, and it probably is living on the mountain laurel in the front of my house, which looks like uh, is very related to rhododendrons. Um, and there's probably other rhododendrons in the area as well that they could be using as their host plants. Um, I know it doesn't look like a moth, it actually is. Um, it's more closely related to some of those clear wing moths that um, I showed you earlier um, that are day active, acting moths. So again, slow down, keep your eyes open. Um, you never know what you might find. Um, I can stop for questions. I didn't pull a slide in. Let's see if we've got any questions here. We have a couple. So the, the butterfly moths or hummingbird moths, those are the, they're snow, there's a couple different names they go by. Snowberry clearwing is one of them. I can't remember what the other one is right off the top of my head. Um, clearwing moths, but we often refer to them as hummingbird moths because that's what they look like, um, is hummingbirds. And is there another question there that I missed? That's all I see. Okay. Um, so real quick, I want to talk about threats and conservation. Like a lot of insects, moths are declining. Um, the uh, level of decline is kind of unknown at this point. And part of that is because we don't have really good numbers, uh, baseline numbers to know where we started um, in terms of population. I think that um, a lot of researchers didn't realize that the declines could be as percent precipitous as they have apparently been in the last number of years. And so when they went back and started looking at data, they realized, well, we were getting great data on the species that were out there. We weren't necessarily getting great numbers, get, getting great um, information on the numbers in those species. So again, we, we don't have a complete way of quantifying um, the threats right now, but a lot of the threats that are impacting moths are the same threats that are impacting a lot of our insects. So bear with me if you've heard this before because it's going to sound very similar to um, anytime you've heard me potentially talk about butterflies or fireflies <laughs> or the like. So three key threats right now, habitat loss, light pollution, and pesticides. Um, Habitat loss because we, you know, uh, we're losing open space to development. Obviously, that's just a general loss of, of habitat for a lot of different species. Um, also, on a smaller scale, the reduction in leaf litter because, as, as I said, a lot of these um, caterpillars like to pupate in that leaf litter. And so, when we rake up all the leaves off of our lawn and we put them in bags and we put them out on the street to be picked up as trash, we are throwing away caterpillar pupa a lot of times. And so um, something that we want to be aware of. In addition, um, since these moths, caterpillars evolved with our native plants, they need those native plants to eat. And they can't eat the, a lot of the um, non-native plants that we have. And it's not just a matter of non-native plants being invasive, although that can be a problem. It's more a matter of 
even if you have non-native plants in your yard that aren't invasive plants, these caterpillars can't eat them because they don't know what they are. So planting native plants is really the only way that you can help native species of moths and other insects that need those plants to eat in their larval states. Um, light pollution is a huge issue. This is a picture from the International Space Station in 2017. Up in this top right corner, this is Hartford, Connecticut. Um, we come down uh, 95 into New York in Newark, New Jersey, uh, across the state of New Jersey. And then this big bright patch down here is Philadelphia on the lower left side. So um, this constant, constant corridor of light that is really bad for night requiring insects. Um, and it's bad for a couple of reasons. So the cumulative effect of so many lights means we have what's called increased sky glow. So in other words, the sky is never really dark in populated areas, um, not dark like it should be. And that impacts the visibility of stars, it impacts the visibility of the moon, which impacts the visibility of moths to be able to orient themselves properly. Um, also, some moths really need dark to be able to comfortably function. Um, that constant level of light is an impact, has negative impacts on their system. Kind of like when we don't get enough sleep. Um, we need that level of sleep to function. And moths and other night functioning creatures like bats and fireflies also need that level of dark to function. Um, and then there's the direct impact from um, artificial lights in the environment. So lights on our houses and our streets and our cars um, and how they act as uh, light traps for moths in certain circumstances. Um, and so that, you know, the level of light pollution that we have can have serious impacts on their lifestyle. And then pesticides is an, an ongoing problem for a lot of insects um, and probably one of the largest causes uh, for decline um, for a lot of species, including moths. Um, they can have direct impact in terms of, um, you know, uh, insecticides that just actually kill um, the adult moths or larva. But a more problematic issue is indirect, where their food supply is contaminated. So we have a category of pesticides um, in the United States that are called neonicotoids, and they're really bad. But the reason that they're really bad is because they are systemic to the plant. So the seeds are actually treated, like when nurseries will grow stuff to be sold in um, a nursery setting, the seeds are treated and the plant absorbs that pesticide into their tissues. And so when a, um, and this can happen for a lot of plants that are sold in the nursery trade, even native plants. So the um, moth comes and says, oh, this is, the, this is the tree that I need, or this is the shrub that I need to lay my eggs on. And they lay their eggs and unbeknownst to them, the moth, the tree is, got these systemic pesticides running through it. And so the eggs hatch and the caterpillars try to eat and then they get poisoned because of the pesticide that's in the leaves. So um, that's not helpful for us to uh, have in our nursery stock. And we're gonna talk a little bit in the next slide about how to prevent that. One of the reasons why they started being used the way that they are, I mean, there's a couple of reasons, but nursery stock, wants their plants to look nice when they're selling them. So if they can keep bugs of any kind, not just moth, but bugs of any kind from eating their leaves while they're sitting on a shelf waiting to be sold to you or I, then we're more likely to buy the plants that don't have leaf damage. Um, the problem is, is that that insecticide lasts longer. The theory was also that it's less harmful to us as humans and in theory, I agree with that because we're not spraying things. It's in the plant, it's contained, we don't have to like spread it all over the environment. The problem is, is that the vast majority of insects that we have, that we need for pollinating fruits and vegetables and flowers and all the things that we like to have in our yard, um, we need insects for that. And those insects almost 
all of them have a phase that eats leaves of something or stems of something. Uh, and so by having these insecticides throughout all those tissues, that's really bad for all of the leaf eating insects. So what can we do? Well, oh, I forgot to change my si slide. Sorry, folks. This is the same things for making your yard firefly friendly. Leave leaf litter. Um, you can go to this website that I've got on the page here. This is the Xerxes Society, www.xerxes.org. They have a ton of information on how to do this and way more detail than I can go into in this presentation about um, the impacts of pesticides, uh, their impact on you know, the environment and specific insects and things like that, and then how to avoid using them, some other things that you might be able to do instead. So have an insecticide-free um, yard. Use pesticides or use them um, extremely limited as a last resort. Um, for really bad um, infestations of things and target those infestations to things like Japanese beetles um, that aren't native that do a lot of damage to our gardens um, and take food away from the native insects in some cases as well. So um, think about what you're trying to get rid of and how you might try to uh, achieve that in a way that doesn't require spraying a lot of chemicals all over your yard. Um, Double check when you're purchasing your plants. So as I said, uh, the idea of having neonex in plants is really, really common in the nursery trade. And it's particularly common in nursery stock that's sold in big box stores and bigger nurseries. So check. Um, most of the things that you buy in a big box store have a tag on them and it will say that it's been treated with this. And don't buy it. Um, express your displeasure to the store. Um, you know, there are a lot of native sources in our area for plants. Um, some of those resources are on our websites. If you have specific questions about where to look for native plants that you want for your yard, um, shoot me an email because I'm happy to point you in a direction um, for some resources. So those, you know, all of those things are going to help. And the more we speak up as consumers to say, we don't want this in our plants, um, hopefully that can apply some pressure and change back to not having them in our plants because they're not good for our native insects. Um, and along with that, reducing your lawn and planting more native plants can go a long way towards making your yard um, more friendly for moths and other native species of insects. And then particularly for moths and fireflies, um, make your outside lighting less disruptive at night, especially in the summer when moths are active. So there's lots of things that you can do. There's a bunch of information on the Xerxes Society website, uh, but some key things that you can do are, you know, limit lighting to intended areas using covers that direct the light down rather than just letting it go up into the air and contributing to that um, sky glow. Um, closing your curtains to keep your inside light in at night and not spilling over into the outside. Again, just ways that we can help um, reduce the level of light pollution in our environment. And again, there's, like I said, there's lots of, of information on their website um, about that. And the last thing that I just want to mention is um, about bug zappers, <laughs> because um, as we're going to see in a minute, Moths are attracted to UV light more than anything else in the world, and bug zappers are based on UV light. And the theory is you put up a bug zapper, you get rid of mosquitoes in your yard. Sorry, folks, mosquitoes aren't attracted to UV light. So they're not going to get rid of any of the mosquitoes in your yard or very few of the mosquitoes in your yard. What they will kill is your moths. Um, so try to reduce your use of bug zappers because if you're using them for mosquitoes, they're really not helping you anyway. Um, there's other methods for trying to get rid of mosquitoes in your yard and um, bug zappers won't help. So I'm going to check questions really quick and then we're going to talk about moth watching at home and how we can do that. Yeah, somebody commenting on the best examples of the decline in the population of nocturnal in insects and even day flying insects is how many fewer insects we see today um, smashed on a windshield when we're driving. And that is very true. 
Um, and again, it's hard to quantify because nobody really counted the number of bugs that were smashed on a windshield. We just always knew it was a lot. But now we notice that they're not there. Um, so yeah, that's a huge issue. Um, screech owls, yes, yeah, screech owls often get hit chasing moths into the headlights of cars. That's very true. Um, and a problem, again, it, it contributes to the light pollution because the moths are attracted to the lights and the screech owls are following the moths. Um, uh, yeah, somebody says, I bought a plant because it had a caterpillar on it. I've actually bought a plant because it had a caterpillar on it as well. Um, somebody that I work with actually bought, was in the grocery store and was buying, wasn't necessarily going to buy parsley and realized that there was a black swallowtail caterpillar on the parsley in the grocery store and so bought the parsley to bring the caterpillar home. So yay, save the caterpillars. Last one, so uh, getting rid of mosquitoes. Okay, so um, the biggest thing that you can do for um, trying to get rid of mosquitoes without impacting other insect species is to um, make sure that there's no standing water in your yard. Um, and unfortunately, if there's standing water in your neighbor's yard, it, you're still gonna have a problem. And so unless you really sort of get everybody on board, um, you know, I've done everything I can do to reduce um, standing water in my own yard, but I know that one of my neighbors has a boat that has a tarp over top of it that almost consistently has a puddle in it for a large portion of the summer. And I discovered the other day that my other neighbor on the other side has a fire pit that they're not using that they didn't cover or turn upside down and it's full of water. So I'm sure it's also full of mosquitoes. So those are the, that's like the number one thing that you can do and try to encourage your neighbors as well to look for sources of water um, because you know the mosquitoes aren't only gonna stay in their yard if they're breeding there. Um, the other thing is, and this does have some potential impact, but again, it's kind of that give or take and you have to find that balance. So um, mowing things a little bit lower, or not letting weedy, really weedy areas of your yard get overgrown. Uh, mosquitoes will sort of use that as their nursery once they're out of the water areas, and they like to hide in that. And the more that you have of that, the more it's going to attract mosquitoes to your yard. So, um, well, excuse me, there's, we want to leave some weedy areas because a lot of our native insects like that as well. You kind of have to find the balance in your yard for, um, keeping mosquitoes at bay. And honestly, I think, you know, the ideas of um, there are natural insect repellents, a lot of the lemon eucalyptus oil, and I know people have mixed results with them, but for the, if you're out in your yard early in the morning or late in the evening, they often do work well enough to keep mosquitoes away from you. And in your immediate area, um, oftentimes citronella candles really do help. Um, if you're staying sort of in that one area of your patio, you need a bunch of them, but those are the kinds of things that can help. Um, and they're not really gonna have a significant impact on the other insects in your yard. But getting rid of standing water is an absolute key. So moth watching at home. So um, there's a couple of ways that you can do this and I'm gonna talk um, in more detail about light stations and bait stations in the next couple of slides. But one of the things that you can do is to check blooming flowers at night. So if you have a garden that has a lot of native blooming flowers in it at night, or a lot of native blooming flowers, you probably don't pay attention to it at night because you're used to being out there during the daytime. Go out at midnight and see if there's any moths um, on your flowers because you might be pleasantly surprised at uh, the things that might be actually visiting your flowers at night. The other thing that you can do is to get um, a black light flashlight. So hopefully you can see this. This is a black light flashlight that I have. It's just like a normal flashlight. It's, it, it looks purple. Um, you're not going to probably be able to see that on the video screen because it just shows up as a bright white light, but it is kind of that purple UV black light kind of um, look to it. And Many caterpillars glow in UV light. So this is, um, this is a kind of sphinx moth. I don't know exactly which one, 
but this is what it looks like just normally. And so you can imagine, I mean, this has a flash on it. Somebody's taking a picture of this at night and you can imagine that without the flash, it's hard to see this. But if you have a black light flashlight, it looks like this and it kind of glows in the dark and it makes it much more apparent. So you can sort of check your shrubs or your lower growing trees, um, some of your flowers at night with a black light flashlight and see if you can find any glowing caterpillars or other insects. A number of insects glow in UV light. Um, these guys aren't very expensive. This one uh, was less than 10 bucks. Um, and there's a number of different, uh, this is Tautronics, T-A-O-Tronics, um, uses a couple AA batteries and you're good to go. So not a very expensive tool at all. Um, and you might find some really cool things. Uh, the other thing that you can do is moths eyes do actually glow in the dark when they're illuminated like a lot of other in, uh, creatures that we see at night. So if you're out and about, you can look for that eye glow with your flashlight or a headlamp. So you can see in this picture, they actually really do glow in the dark when they're illuminated. So you can look for that light um, and see if they're around. Now, that may not necessarily help you get down to the species identification level, uh, and that's okay. At least you're getting a sense of um, the other things that are sharing your environment, um, particularly things that we don't often see because they're out in the dark. So the other thing that you can do is set up a, um, a light station. Um, so <laughs> I know my promo for this said I was going to have examples from my own light station. So my light station is this one up here um, in the upper right corner uh, with this sort of brick wall. My moth station this year did not work very well at all. And I'm not entirely sure why, um, because I had fairly decent luck with it last year when I did it. Um, not as good as we get like in the middle of our crossways preserve, but not too bad. The first time I did it this year, I think it was too cold. I think there just wasn't very much out. Even though it was June, it was a night that was relatively um, cool out and I just don't think very much was flying. And then the last time, I don't know. I suspect that the level of light pollution in my area is worse than it was last year. I have um, behind my house an area that's um, relatively industrial and they're doing construction and there's a lot more lights out there than there used to be. And so I'm concerned that that is part of what um, drove the moths away. But you can see it's really not that hard. Um, this is a sheet that's held up with magnet clips to my garage door. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the light source uh, in a minute because there's a couple of different things that you can do. You know, you can go very simple approach. This is just a, a hanging um, hook with a light source and just using the wall of the house uh, because it's white and that's perfectly fine. Another garage um, approach here with uh, um, a three light source and I'll explain why they did that in a, a second. But so one of the things um, in general, you know, any kind of light will work. I mean, obviously you've probably all seen moths, some moths circling around lights that you might have on your front porch and it's annoying because they land on your door and you have to open your door and then they fly inside and all that stuff. So really any light can work um, and the brighter the better. But to really attract the widest variety of moths, you need a UV light source. And there's two ways to get that. One is a black light. Um, so like this, the black light, you know, those purple glowing lights that you've probably seen, um, that's one of the ways that you can do it. Now, they do now make what they call white black lights, which is what this is down here, this tube. So you can see it's not purple. It actually looks like a white light bulb, um, but it is actually putting out UV light. So that will attract moths and you can get um, covers for them so that it helps protect them so they won't break, you know, that they can um, sort of take a little bit of wear and tear from hanging outside and you can use those. These guys are relatively inexpensive, um, two to five dollars a tube, so not that expensive. Um, you might, they don't, they're not, um, Oftentimes they're not bright enough on their own, which is why this one over here, this person sets up three of them in their, um, on their light sheet for um, trying to attract moths because one may not be enough. They just don't have a high enough output of light. 
Um, but if you want to give it a try and see what you can get, certainly think about getting one um, and a very simple light fixture. Sometimes you can buy them with the electronics sort of already attached to them and, you know, hang it up and see what happens. Um, I said, they're not very expensive at all. The other thing in the way that I've done it here, and this is what a lot of other mothers do, is to use metal halide bulbs. Now, these bulbs are, um, they have mercury in them, so they're not particularly user-friendly. You need to be really careful. They burn really hot, so you need to be careful where they are, what's around them. Um, that's why I have mine in a, a metal um, shop light uh, protective thing to help make sure nobody bumps into it. Um, they, they, if like they get a drop of rain on them, they can explode because they're so hot. So you need to make sure of the weather forecast before you put them out, those kinds of things. Um, they will generally attract the widest variety of moths, but they're also very expensive. They're like $20 a bulb. Um, the bulb will last for a while, so it's not like you're going to go through it in a night, but um, they are kind of expensive. So if you're if you're just starting out and sort of, you know, want to see what's out there and get a sense of it, I'd go with the black light and maybe look for one of these white black lights and give it a try and see what you can get. Um, again, the greatest variety of moths that you're going to get at home or anywhere that you have the opportunity to see moths at night is very late at night to very early in the morning. So think 11 o'clock to 2 a.m. kind of a thing um, when it's really, really dark outside. So either be prepared to stay up. Uh, a lot of people set up their light before they go to bed and go to bed for a couple hours and get up at two in the morning and go see what's on their sheet. Um, and that's certainly, you know, you don't necessarily have to sit up the whole time. A lot of times if the moths are attracted in, they're pretty much gonna stay there all night. So, you know, you don't have to be there every waking moment, um, although it can be very addictive <laughs> to sit there and see what comes to the sheet. I will say from experience. Um, one thing I will say is if you're going to try this at home, don't do it more than one night in a row because it that interferes too much with sort of the native cycles of the moths, the natural cycles. So think about doing it maybe once a week. Um, but you can pretty much do this from the time it starts warming up in August, I mean in March, until you know September. Um, and the moths that you get will vary depending on the season and what's flying. So, um, you know, you can do it a couple of times a month if you're curious to see what's out there. And again, if you're in an area that tends to be a little bit darker and doesn't have a lot of light pollution around you, um, you're probably going to have better results uh, than I did um, this year. So, and then the other thing, if you're going to do this, um, you really, really, really should try to get up well before sunrise um, and turn off your light source. Obviously, you're going to want to see what's on your sheet, but turn off your light source and give those moths a chance to disperse because if you don't, that's breakfast for every single bird in your neighborhood. Um, and birds will learn, <laughs> especially birds that nest right around your yard. If you do this frequently, they will learn that that sheet means a buffet and sometimes they will wait there for them, you know, for the moths to appear. So um, you might also potentially, depending on where you live, attract toads, uh, which will come to eat on the moths. And I can guarantee you will get other insects besides moths on your uh, sheet, um, which in and of itself can also be kind of cool to see what's there. Some of them are really phenomenally unique uh, and fun to look at and kind of freaky as well. And it's just, it's really cool. So um, don't get freaked out if you get other things besides moths, because you will attract other things besides moths to your sheet. On the back, um, if you go onto that, uh, looking for the common moths family hang, handout. Um, and I will try to make sure that we link um, to that site uh, when we post this video on the YouTube channel. So on the back side of that where the common moths are, they also have um, some other insect families that you might get um, on your light. So to help you sort of identify them. So that's, that's uh, a fun way of checking out some of the insects in your area. The other thing that you can do is to create what's called a bait station. Not all moths come to light. So basically you're gonna create this sugary fermented kind of bait and paint it on your trees. Um, there is no exact recipe for this. Uh, I 
you know, if you're really interested in doing this, I would say, you know, investigate, um, search online for moth bait station kind of recipes um, because you, everybody's got a little bit different take. But generally, I've kind of listed the recommended thing here is um, a bottle of stale beer, usually dark is recommended, um, dark brown sugar, um, mushy bananas, so really, really over, really overripe bananas, like even too far gone for banana bread kind of bananas. Um, or if you don't have those, get a can of peaches and heavy syrup. Uh, we don't want sugar-free here, we want the syrup because we want to make this sort of ferment and we need that syrup to attract those uh, moths in. And so basically what you're gonna do is mash up the bananas or the peaches um, really fine. You know, potato masher works really well, kind of put it in a bucket, um, add the other ingredients, you kind of want it um, relatively thick and syrupy. It shouldn't be like water thin. It, it needs to have some body to it. And basically you wanna let it sit in the sun for a couple of days. Um, they recommend putting like a piece of newspaper with a rubber band or a piece of cheesecloth with a rubber band over top of it just to keep the insects out of it. Uh, but if you put a tight lid on it, sometimes it will ferment and create gas, which you don't want it to blow that lid off. So um, dark rum is sometimes also recommended. Um, Again, no specific recipe, kind of just give and take a little bit. A lot of people are like, it's a whole pound of brown sugar, it's a bottle of stale beer, it's a can of peaches with their heavy syrup and a couple ounces of rum, and then they just let it sit for a couple of days, and then you paint it on a tree. Um, try not to drip it on the ground when you're painting on a tree because it will attract ants, and so you want to um, make sure that it's you know up on the tree. Um, and you can see here, this is not mine, this is from somebody else online, but uh, this tree was painted. You can see the darker areas of the tree trunk here. This is where uh, the bait was painted on and the moths are just all over it. Um, and so basically paint it on, you leave it, come out in the night and look at it with a flashlight um, and just be aware that again, moths do hear and they do sense motion. So you approach them quietly and slowly um, so that they don't all fly away on you. But you can get uh, bait, you know, do bait stations for uh, attracting moths. And this will often attract different moths than would come to your light station because, as I said earlier, not every moth is really attracted to light. A couple of citizen science projects really quick that you can do. So the um, butterflies and moths of North America or Bamona, uh, is a website that is collecting information about butterflies and moths all across North America. Yeah, the website's there. Basically, you need to create a free account. They ask you to submit a clear, high quality close up photograph of a butterfly, moth, caterpillar, egg, or pupa. So, any stage of life. And you do not have to be able to identify it. Um, a regional coordinator will review your submission and work to identify it. Um, and so you don't actually have to be able to identify it. So don't let that scare you. If you've got um, good pictures of moths or butterflies, caterpillars, those kinds of things, um, this is one way to help contribute to our understanding of what species are out there. Uh, the other way, if you are an iNaturalist user, there are a couple of projects that are there. So right now we're in the middle of National Moth Week. So any observations that you make of moths, caterpillars of them or the moths themselves um, will go into this project. And so right now, well, when I ran this report the other day, oops, sorry. When I ran this report, it was 23,000 observations, I think. Uh, so my screen is kind of funky. I can't actually read what's under there. Um, you can probably see it better than I can. Uh, but I think it was 23,000 different observations that were made of moths and butterflies um, in this week. And so, you know, if you have a chance to um, go out and try to look for some moths, put them on iNaturalist and, and uh, help contribute to this project. If you can't do it this year, that's okay. This happens every year. So there'll be another opportunity next year. And hopefully next year, uh, we will be doing, we have done this before, where we try to do an actual moth night and we set up a light trap here um, on one of our properties and invite people to come out and try to see the moths that we can get. Uh, and so hopefully um, this time next year, we'll be able to be doing something like that, actually more out in the field. 
uh, and inviting you to come join us for that. The other project on iNaturalist that you can participate in is the Butterflies and Moths of Pennsylvania. And this is actually run by the same people that do the Bamona. This is just their iNaturalist project and they have it divided by state. Um, I did notice that not every state has a project because like I have pictures of butterflies from Arizona and I wanted to try to upload them um, to you know get them to count into the project for butterflies and moths of Arizona and I think they don't have a regional coordinator so there is no project. We're lucky that we have one in Pennsylvania. Um, if you're an iNaturalist user, this is a project that you physically have to add your observations to. You need to join the project and actually add your observations. It won't just suck them in. Um, so be aware of that. If you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about with iNaturalist, that's okay. Um, on September 2nd, I am doing a webinar all about iNaturalist and how to use it. And so I will talk about projects and adding your um, observations, how to make an observation, how to add an observation to projects, um, and how to use iNaturalist because it is a way that we at Wissick and Trails are using to try to help us monitor the wildlife that's on our preserves. So it's a really cool tool um, to help you identify things when you're in the field. And so if you don't know about it, um, please consider, I don't think it's on the website yet, but it'll be up shortly, um, signing up for the webinar on September 2nd and um, joining us for that. And then lastly, um, some additional resources. So um, there's really only one field guide for moth identification and it's this Peterson guide um, to the moths of North, Northeastern North America. It's very specific. And even at that, it covers about 15,000 moths that are in sort of that general area of northeastern North America, and that's not all of them. Um, I've actually used iNaturalist to identify a couple of moths at my house that aren't actually in this field guide. <laughs> so um, it's not everything, but it's a really good start. And it's the only field guide like this that is this comprehensive. Um, you can see it's not exactly pocket size. It's rather uh, voluminous. I mean, it is a small book but it's thick, it's heavy, um, but it is really good. It's got all the moths. It's just like a typical Peterson field guide. If you've ever seen them for birds, it's got the species accounts. It talks about their host plants. Um, so yeah, it's uh, um, really good from that perspective and really the only thing that's out there. Now, the other thing that can be helpful, um, iNaturalist can help a lot with this and, and can avoid um, using a field guide if, you aren't interested in purchasing one, but kind of the um, partner to the field guide to the moths is the field guide to the caterpillars. Uh, because a lot of the moths we actually do see as caterpillars more than we see them as moths. Again, not a small book. Uh, this is butterflies and moths as well. It's not just moths. So there's butterfly caterpillars in here, but by and large, it's, it is moths. Uh, the nice thing about this one is that it gives you um, the caterpillar and it will give you what the adult moth looks like and then a description of them. So um, somebody asked about the woolly bear and I'm going to look that up. The last two books that were on here are um, uh, over and above if you're really interested in um, going a little bit deeper than I've gone tonight into moth ecology or understanding um, the functions of their scales and how to find them and how to see them and all of those kinds of things. Um, the Discovering Moths book um, on the far right is actually a really easy read. I don't think it's in print anymore but used copies of it are very available um, and it's not particularly expensive. And it was a really intriguing kind of um, a book to read. The Moths Complete Guide to Biology and Behavior is much more in depth. Um, it's not a huge book. It's actually rather thin, but it is tiny print and very packed with information. Um, but again, if you're interested in going a little bit deeper, um, getting those from the library or you know checking those out um, can be a, a way to do this. And last slide I have here, because this is a question that I always get asked, woolly bear caterpillars do not tell winter. Um, so I'm sorry, but I'm gonna dispel that myth for you. And I am trying to find the... Um, 
So woolly bears are the caterpillar of the Isabella moth, and the moth there is on the right. Um, they are when they're orange and black as a caterpillar, and the amount of orange and black is actually a function of their instar stage. So as they get older, um, they tend to lose black. Each time they molt, the orange band in the middle tends to get bigger. So the caterpillars that you see in the fall are actually probably pretty close to a lot of times their final instar stage and looking for a place to spend the winter. These guys have a unique um, mechanism to be able to spend the winter in our area. So they look for a hiding place in leaf litter, under a log, um, someplace somewhat protected like that, and they actually freeze. They don't really hibernate, they literally freeze. Um, their body produces kind of a cryoprotectant antifreeze that they pump through their system. And then with the first hard frost, they actually freeze completely. And they spend the winter frozen. And in the spring, they thaw. And they actually then um, will eat for a very short period of time to sort of revive themselves after being frozen for the winter and then um, almost immediately turn into their pupil state and into the cocoon, um, excuse me, and come out. So somebody asked a question earlier about um, the host plant for the um, woolly bear. And the ones that you see in the fall scurrying around, and I'm trying to find the right page and I can't actually find the right page, um, to the ones that you see crossing the sidewalk and stuff like that in the fall, you don't actually need to worry about putting on a host plant. They are looking for a place to hibernate um, and they are well on their way. So I wouldn't worry too much about them um, at all. I cannot find the right page to find their host plants. These guys are actually ones that I believe are a little bit more of a generalist um, anyway. So what host plants they're on is not nearly as um, important as it is for some other plants. And I have to say, so as complete as this field guide is of caterpillars, there's not actually this woolly bear caterpillar in here. And again, just because there's so many species, they didn't put them all in the field guide. I would have thought that one would have been in here um, just because it is so common, but I'm not actually seeing it. One more page. The problem is there's a couple of caterpillars that are called woolly bear. Um, but when we think of woolly bears, we think of these orange and black ones, and they're, they are the caterpillar of this Isabella moth. Um, Yeah, these guys are tussock moths. And so like a lot of other caterpillars, they do um, a lot of different kinds of trees, oak, birch, willow, beech, um, those kinds of things. So um, as a caterpillar, they're probably gonna be higher up in the trees. Um, it's those ones that you see in the fall that are um, gonna be down you know, in the grass looking for some place to hibernate um, for the year. Uh, these guys will also eat dandelion, grass, regular grass, um, lettuce, <laughs> and nettle. Um, so a bunch of uh, food sources on the ground as well. So, okay, I'm going to stop here. This is my last slide. Uh, so I'm going to take the last set of questions and... Oh, what adaptive function is served for the moths being attracted to light? Uh, from our perspective of being attract, uh, attracted to a light or trapped in a light that's going to put them on a sheet on our garage door, um, there is no adaptive function for that. Um, it's probably a byproduct of 
their um, just their overall functioning and how they use light to orient themselves that gets them caught in our lights. Um, that and that's really not an adaptive function for them at all. In fact, it's probably somewhat detrimental, which is why we recommend that you don't put out a moth um, presentation or moth uh, um, light very often uh, because it is detrimental to them and can attract predators to the area. Uh, the southeastern Peterson guide has some species in our area that aren't in the northeastern guide. Yeah, so again, it's it's just because there's simply so many different species, um, it's hard to get them all in one field guide. The Seek app for my naturalist is good for identifying. Yeah, same. It's the same system that works on both. And when I do the presentation in September, I will cover Seek as well. Um, Seek is a, a great one that um, a lot of folks with kids use because it's a little bit more kind of scavenger hunty, or it can be um, if you use it that way. So um, I'll cover that in the presentation in September as well. Uh, website for host plants. Okay. Um, yep. There's a lot of, uh, um, yeah, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Deciduous trees. <laughs> yeah, we got there. Um, all right. Any other questions? Uh, 462. Yep, I got it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, yeah, um, like I said, it, you know, that's all I've got for tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you have any specific questions or want um, specific information on, setting up a light trap and want more detailed information, um, I do have resources that I can point you to on like where to buy the light bulbs and that kind of stuff. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, please feel free to shoot me an email. Um, if you want more information on native plant resources, um, again, please do not hesitate to send me an email and I can get some information um, directed to you um, to help you uh, with that. So um, just check this make sure there's no additional questions so yeah thanks everybody for joining us uh and hopefully we'll see you at our next presentation good night all <laughs>